So it's not that the stronger the currency, the longer the hyperinflation lasts. It's that the reserve currency, because it is used in international trade, has a privilege to export inflation until such a time that its currency dies in its domestic market. And then as it is dying, the international market converges on the United States and sends back the dollars in a wave, making the hyperinflation, the flight to real goods in the United States, that much quicker. And what do the U.S. citizens hoard during a dollar hyperinflation? There is no other currency to hoard. And it's not going to be Bitcoin because Bitcoin is a dollar derivative. The only thing underneath the dollar in Exeter's pyramid is gold and silver itself. In the realm of economic discussions, the specter of hyperinflation often looms as a cautionary tale of economic collapse and financial turmoil. Traditionally associated with unstable economies in developing nations, hyperinflation is a phenomenon where the value of a currency rapidly declines, leading to skyrocketing prices and a loss of purchasing power. However, what if this scenario were to unfold not in a struggling third world country, but in the economic powerhouse of the United States? In a thought-provoking analysis presented by Rafi Fava, an exploration into the dynamics of hyperinflation, particularly focusing on the potential for dollar one hyperinflation in the US unveils a unique perspective that challenges conventional understanding. Through examining the experiences of countries grappling with hyperinflation and the role of the US dollar as the global reserve currency, this video sheds light on why dollar one hyperinflation may unfold at an accelerated pace compared to historical examples. Faber's analysis begins by dissecting the mechanisms behind hyperinflation in various countries, including Argentina, Lebanon, Egypt, Syria, Venezuela, and Iran. In these nations, hyperinflation is not merely a sudden cataclysmic event, but rather a gradual erosion of currency value, marked by citizens' reliance on alternative currencies, particularly the US dollar, to preserve their savings and maintain basic economic transactions. Citizens hoard dollars as a hedge against their depreciating local currencies, effectively exporting the inflationary pressures back to the United States. This phenomenon, described as keeping the economy on a drip feed, prolongs the agony of hyperinflation in these countries, albeit at a slower pace. Before we continue to delve into this discussion, please subscribe to our channel and activate the bell icon for timely updates. Why will a dollar hyperinflation happen a lot faster than hyperinflations of other currencies? in other countries. Well, think about it this way. When a third world country hyperinflates, what do they do? What do its citizens do? They hoard US dollars. And by hoarding US dollars, they preserve some purchasing power for themselves. And trade basically goes on on a drip feed. The economy is on a drip feed. People get slowly poorer and poorer quickly, but not hyper quickly. Wealth gets more and more drained as they become poorer and poorer and poorer, and they hoard more and more US dollars and dump more and more of their local currency that they're paid in. But on the other side of this is the benefit that the US, the United States, especially United States dollar holders and people in the United States who use dollars for their everyday purchases and expenses, they get to export their inflation or the Fed's inflation to those foreign countries that keep them on a drip feed and prevent the system from entirely imploding overnight. This is exactly what is going on in Argentina. It is what is going on in Lebanon, in Syria, in Egypt, in Venezuela, in Iran. I'll show you all these charts. It's all the same thing. The first thing I want to show you is this table from the IMF, those wonderful people at the International Monetary Fund. Uh, we can thank them for all of the good that happens in the world. Uh, we have here the COFR, the Currency Composition of Official Foreign Exchange Reserves. This is how many of each currency exists in the balance sheets of central banks that are not the Federal Reserve. And we see here that the U.S. dollars, claims in U.S. dollars, are consistently at the top at $6.5 trillion. This represents mostly U.S. Treasuries, Treasury bills, Treasury bonds, Treasury notes, $6.5 trillion out of a total of foreign exchange reserves of $11.9 trillion. So this is what they call reserve currency status. The dollar is the currency that is the most in demand by foreign countries. And we see the second is the euro, then the renminbi, then the yen. But it gets really, really insignificant as you go down the chain. After euros, there really isn't much 
uh, foreign currency and other central banks that are not in that home country. And you can see that our, the Argentinian peso and the Iranian real and the Egyptian pound and all that stuff basically does not exist here. Uh, claims in other currencies, that's all other global currencies, is just $426 billion out of $11.9 trillion. It's insignificant. And so if we look at this chart, this graph first, we can see that the dollar peso exchange rate goes higher and higher and higher. But this is the statutory rate. This is the rate controlled legally by the Argentinian central bank. It is not the black market rate. Or the black market, of course, is the real market. And you see here when Mille was elected, he devalued the official rate from 357 to now 847. It is devaluing on a steady pace again here. And what is happening as the peso is devalued is that the dollar is hoarded more and more and more by the Argentinians who use it to preserve their savings. And then they exchange it back into pesos when they have to make a purchase and the peso loses value over time faster and faster but at a steady rate here. And so the U.S. gets to export its inflation to Argentina and that keeps it on a drip feet and alive. And we see here the same thing in Egypt. We see these like cusps, these sudden jumps in the exchange rate. And the reason for this is that, let's say, Egypt wants to maintain a certain exchange rate or a statutory exchange rate with the dollar. And so they sell their foreign exchange reserves in order to strengthen uh, the pound. But then they don't have any foreign exchange. And so they can't make payments for commodities internationally. They can't import commodities and their entire economy shuts down until they allow the exchange rate to decline over here or rise, or it depends on when you want to see it. And we saw here these happening successively in 2022, like October 2022, another time in January 2023, and finally here from about 25, 26 pounds per dollar to 48 pounds per dollar. And meanwhile, Egyptians do not use their currency. They use U.S. dollars. They have to use their currency in local transactions, but they save what they can in U.S. dollars. And that's why the pound keeps getting worse and worse and worse, because the Egyptians are demanding dollars. They can still use dollars, and therefore the trade system, the monetary system, still is on a drip feed. And that's what makes the hyperinflation drawn out and excruciating and never ending. Same thing in Lebanon. We see these statutory rates breaking again and again and again, trying to maintain the exchange rate, but it not working and then devaluing. And then the Lebanese hoarding US dollars and their economy in shambles. But still, there isn't complete lawlessness there because they still have a basic monetary system on a drip feed thanks to supplies of black market US dollars, which are exported from the United States into Lebanon and keeping them on a drip feed. Same thing in Syria we see here. They print money to plug up their fiscal deficits and then have to devalue the currency here once in 2020, another time in 2021. And finally here from 1,775 pounds to the dollar to 13,000 and all of a sudden everybody is so much poor, but they need to do this in order to import more foreign exchange so that they can pay for commodities so people don't literally starve to death and there isn't complete lawlessness in Lebanon. Same thing in Iran, same story here. Central to this analysis is the role of the US e dollar as the global reserve currency, underscored by data from the International Monetary Fund M for revealing the dominance of the dollar in foreign exchange reserves. With a staggering dollar six five trillion held in US treasuries and other dollar denominated assets, compared to a mere dollar four hundred twenty six billion in other global currencies, the dollar status as the preferred reserve currency is unequivocal. This reserve currency privilege allows the United States to export its inflationary pressures abroad, sustaining demand for the dollar even as its domestic monetary policy undergoes strain. Faber elucidates how the export of US inflation serves as a double-edged sword. While it temporarily alleviates domestic inflationary pressures by offloading excess liquidity onto foreign markets, it also sets the stage for a potential reckoning. In the event of a severe financial crisis necessitating massive money printing by the Federal Reserve, the flood of newly minted dollars would trigger a rapid devaluation of the currency. This scenario, often dismissed due to the dollar's perceived strength, overlooks the crucial factor of dollar hoarding by foreign entities. They keep devaluing their currency relative to the dollar because everybody needs the dollars to survive because they can't survive on their own currency and they have the semblance of a monetary system through the dollar reserve but their currency keeps dying i thought it was called the iranian real now it's the toman i think it changed names i don't know what's going on here 
point I'm trying to make here is that you could make a false extrapolation and say, well, weak currencies are taking such and such a time, such a long time to collapse to zero. Then a fortiori, the dollar, which is the strongest currency in the world because it's the reserve currency, will take a very, very long time. We have decades left until there's hyperinflation in the dollar, but that is just the opposite. It is a false extrapolation. It's exactly the opposite of what will happen. And why is that? Because what is keeping these other countries' monetary systems on a drip feed? That is the export of U.S. dollars from the U.S. to these countries because these countries' citizens, they need U.S. dollars to survive because their currencies don't work. And so the U.S. can export its inflation, and that is what keeps the dollar alive or looking stronger. But what happens when the dollar dies in the domestic market in the United States because there is one final financial crisis and the Fed has to print seven, eight trillion dollars overnight, then in that event, what happens to all the dollar reserves of these countries that are hoarding US dollars? Their value evaporates very quickly. And so what do they do? They turn around and they take all of their dollar stacks and they send it back to the United States for whatever they can. They sell their treasuries, they sell their dollar cash, for whatever real assets they can get. And so the flight to real assets happens not only in the United States, but in other countries that hoard US dollars. As Faber contends, the collapse of the dollar in the domestic market would trigger a swift reversal of the export mechanism as foreign holders rush to offload their dollar reserves. This mass repatriation of dollars would exacerbate hyperinflation within the United States as the influx of currency seeks refuge in tangible assets such as gold and silver. Faber dispels the notion that the strength of a currency prolongs hyperinflation, emphasizing instead the destabilizing impact of a reserve currency's demise on both domestic and global markets. Right? Remember that when other countries are hoarding U.S. dollars, it's not a flight to real goods. Real hyperinflation is a flight to real goods. It's not a flight to another currency. These hyperinflations in other currencies like Lebanon, Syria, Venezuela, Argentina, it's a flight to U.S. dollars. But when there's a flight from U.S. dollars in the domestic U.S. market, then all of the U.S. dollars that were exported to other countries go back to the United States very quickly. And that makes the hyperinflation in the United States that much quicker because all the forces that were slowing down the hyperinflation of the U.S. dollars reverse themselves and come back to the United States with a vengeance. So it's not that the stronger the currency, the longer the hyperinflation lasts. It's that the reserve currency, because it is used in international trade, has a privilege to export inflation until such a time that its currency dies in its domestic market. And then as it is dying, the international market converges on the United States and sends back the dollars in a wave, making the hyperinflation, the flight to real goods in the United States that much quicker. And what do the US citizens hoard during a dollar hyperinflation? There is no other currency to hoard. And it's not going to be Bitcoin because Bitcoin is a dollar derivative. The only thing underneath the dollar in Exeter's pyramid is gold and silver itself. And so we will see a hoarding of gold and silver as the money and the death of the dollar and every other currency based on it. The hyperinflation of the dollar will be the true hyperinflation of every currency in the world. There will be no more rush to US dollars in these foreign countries. They will all rush into real money because there will be no other choice.